All right, well, you know, you guys are stuck with me again for, uh, for better or worse. Um, so hopefully you guys will find this helpful. Um, so the way I've tried to structure it is kind of like a mixed um, talk where I'm gonna both walk you through some paradigms and some empirical results from those paradigms and then that are based on modeling. And then I'll walk you through uh, putting together the actual models um, for those tasks. So you first get to see uh, why it's useful and what the results that can come out of it look like. Um, and then hopefully you'll be even more motivated to know how to do it. Um, so, um, so I sent out a few MATLAB, example MATLAB scripts. Um, so they are, they were definitely in an email um, that everyone should have gotten. If you haven't downloaded them, then uh, I'm sorry. Um, if there's a way you can still get access to them via the internet or whatever, then I hope you can. Um, otherwise, I'll show everything up on uh, up on here. I have MATLAB, I have the scripts open. Um, if you do have the scripts open right now, um, don't look at them yet. Uh, I specifically don't want you to have gone through them before because means you'll have the answers to some things ahead of time where I want you to try to come up with them on the fly as we build stuff. Um, so, okay. Um, so general outline, like I said, so I'll give you some task descriptions and some preliminary empirical results um, from uh, fitting models to behavior um, from people that have done these tasks um, in a bunch of different, in healthy and a bunch of different clinical populations. Um, and there's, there's three of them. There's uh, this approach avoidance conflict task, which is the one I'll probably spend most of the time um, kind of building the model in detail. And the hope is that that'll give you kind of the thorough sense and then I'll walk you through the next task. Then we can kind of go through the model more briefly and hopefully it'll just, and if, even if we don't walk through it in as much detail for the latter ones, um, I'm hoping that'll sort of enforce some kind of generalization. And um, so you can see how it's not just, how the, the kind of general abstract structure of these is actually very similar across specific models we build. Um, and, uh, and so actually the way I've kind of depicted this is a little bit wrong for, for each of these, I'm going to give you somewhat with different levels of detail, um, a kind of hands-on tutorial where we'll build the models, we'll simulate some outputs. I'll make sure you guys have some sense of how to interpret the simulation plots, um, which are honestly not all that straightforward always in, um, papers by Carl and co. Um, and, uh, um, and then I'll actually even show you a little bit about how to estimate parameters. Um, so to actually get individual difference uh, parameter estimates for each person who's done the task. Um, and uh, so at least, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying you'll walk away with this being able to do absolutely everything without any further uh, help, but it should give you a good sense of the process and give you kind of the resources to, you know, practice and move from here. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions or go through further things after at some other point during the week. Um, so. Oh, and then, and then additionally, um, it occurred to me near the end that not most of this is uh, much more inference-based as opposed to learning-based. Um, and uh, active learning is certainly a really important part of active inference, especially when you're doing learning tasks. Um, and so there's a little bit of that in the Freearm Bandit that I'll go over with you um, in a couple of slides, mainly to give you guys a sense of um, how you would do something like reward learning um, in active inference. Um, and how you kind of think about it, it gets cast a little bit differently. Um, and then I might also walk you through um, some of uh, additional kind of simulation paper that um, we have a free print out on right now on um, how to use active inference for structure learning, um, which is more or less just an extension of the way you do active learning. But I think it's a little bit more illustrative of how, um, of how learning parameters um, actually works in these models. So we'll see what we get there. Um, depends on how long some of this takes. Um, so, okay, so first the uh, approach avoidance conflict uh, task. So, so what's approach avoidance conflict? Um, basically, this is something that happens that's a big problem in psychopathology, especially in emotional disorders, um, is that a lot of times you have to choose to approach a situation when both some bad stuff and some good stuff will happen at the same time. Um, or you can avoid the bad stuff um, and go do something safe um, but that means you actually sacrifice a lot of the good stuff you would have gotten as well. Um, so oftentimes what happens in the context of anxiety and depression is that you'll kind of actually end up sacrificing a lot of good things, um, a lot of sort of well-being promoting activities in life um, due to a kind of fear of the inability to handle some of the possible negative outcomes that you'd get as well. Um, so 
the, um, and this is a, a primary target of a lot of interventions, both cognitive behavioral and other, um, basically most psychotherapeutic interventions in one way or another target this. Um, and uh, so, um, the, uh, and this, this applies, for instance, in depression and anxiety. Um, you know, it can be things like avoiding social activities because of fear of judgment or embarrassment. In substance use disorders, it could be like drug taking to avoid withdrawal symptoms, um, things like that, um, where just avoidance is a big, is a big thing. Um, and so people have come up with um, these, these tasks that are supposed to mimic um, having to sort of deal with that kind of conflict. Um, so I'll tell you about one um, specific approach avoidance conflict task that we have used um, and how, we, how you can build a model of it and fit data. Um, so this, um, this particular study and the other ones I'll talk about too, um, all come from this fairly large um, uh, data set um, that we've collected in, uh, in Tulsa Library where I, um, where I work, um, called the T1000. Um, and this is specifically from the first 500 participants of the T1000. It's essentially the exploratory half of a, a larger exploratory confirmatory um, sort of study approach that we've um, been taking. Um, and so for this 500, this is just kind of like a quasi consort diagram, but more or less um, what we end up with is um, 59 healthy controls, 261 people that have um, depression and or anxiety. So this is really meant to be much more kind of transdiagnostic. It's more kind of Ardokian, um, sort of. Um, and then we also have 159 um, in the substance use group, which is um, largely methamphetamine, but there is also some opioid and some other ones in there. So it's, and I should say these, this group also can have a bunch of anxiety and depression in it. Um, so it's really not meant to be this clean, diagnostically carved out uh, sample. Um, so, okay, so the approach avoidance conflict task, basically the way that it works is um, you're shown a little avatar guy like this, um, and you're on this kind of runway, and it has one of nine positions, um, and your job is to choose where you want to move this avatar to. Now, the kind of happy sun picture over there, that stands in for seeing a kind of mildly positive, um, safe stimulus. Um, Whereas the kind of rainy cloud, that means that you are going to see a um, fairly strongly negative stimulus, but you'll also win a certain amount of points um, where this kind of little gauge here tells you how many points. And it can be filled either to two points, four points, or six points. Um, and uh, so, and the idea is that each one of these different positions uh, carries a different probability of getting that outcome or that outcome. Um, so basically, if you're all the way to the right, that means it's 90% chance you'll get this guy, 10% that you'll get that guy, 80, 70, 60, 50, 40, et cetera. Um, so the more you're over here, the higher the chance you're going to get the safe sun thing. The more you're over here, the higher the chance you're going to get the rainy cloud and points thing. Um, but it's not fully deterministic is the point. Um, That's one of the negative stimuli that you'll get if you, uh, if you go for the points. <laughs> so uh, point being, these are legit aversive, um, you know, to the, to the degree that you can get through IRB. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so uh, you know, it's not, we've tried our best to make it so it's not just these purely kind of, you know, mildly negative, you know, you can rate it, but you don't still have that much of a reaction, um, et cetera. <laughs> But then you get this nice, happy, you made points, <laughs> right? So, so there, hence the conflict. Um, so, um, but say instead, uh, so I should say, so different trial, there are different trial types, different conditions where, you know, there's a rainy cloud over here, sun over here, you know, zero points or two points, et cetera. I'll show you the different conditions in a second. But so say instead you get to try to go for the safe thing, then, <laughs> There's your, so there's your happy safe thing. Um, and this is really just meant to be kind of like an anchor, right? Like an anchor kind of safe. You go to it if you are too afraid of the negative thing to get the points, more or less, right? Um, you made zero points. Uh, okay, so here's the five different task conditions in this case. So one we just call avoid threat. Basically there's just rainy cloud and sun. There's no points involved. So really you ought to just all the way over here every time. Um, in this case, 
the approach reward condition. There's both both suns on both sides, but you get points over here. So again, it should just be move all the way to the right. That's what you should do. Um, and then there's conflict two points, conflict four, and conflict six, in which case it's either the sun or rainy cloud plus a certain amount of points. Um, again, two, four, or six. So those are the different conditions. Um, so the um, again, we're going to walk through this in a lot of detail, but the way that we set up the model um, for this, the exact same structure as what I showed you guys yesterday, hopefully some of you still remember a little. Um, but so the idea is you have some prior preferences up here, the C thing, and there are two parameters that we fit for this. Essentially, it's the value that the, um, the agent assigns to the negative stimuli, so essentially how much it dislikes the negative stimuli. And then this VP thing, which is the value it assigned, the subjective value assigned to each point you could win. Um, and so, and so these two things essentially control um, ought to govern a bit, fair amount of behavior because the more you dislike the negative thing and the less um, points are worth, um, the more conflict you ought to have um, in the you ought to be driven to you know toward the sun. Um, um, but then there's beta, so this the uh, prior on uh, expected uh, policy precision. Um, which for the paper, we've just kind of in also labeled decision uncertainty just to kind of make it more intuitive to people who aren't um, active inference experts. Um, and so we're fitting that as well. So it's a, a measure essentially of uncertainty or, or the lack of confidence in your own kind of action model. Um, and in this case, because we're not building in um, any prior habits, um, uh, so E is just flat, um, then this more or less has the effect of making behavior just look more random is less deterministic. Um, it would be different if they, they had strong habits, but since since E is flat, then it basically just governs deterministic versus random sort of uh, less stable behavior in a sense. Um, the states here are more or less, the agent has to have beliefs about where it is on the runway, and the agent also has to know things about what task condition it's in. Um, policies are pretty straightforward. You can choose to move to one of any of the places of nine places on the runway um, and the actual observations, right? So what the agent needs to observe to figure out the runway position and the task condition um, and to make a decision. So there's three different sets of observations. One is just runway position cues and the other is the task condition cues. Um, so literally just what you see on the screen. Um, and then three are gonna be um, observing the outcome stimuli. So the, the um, negative and positive images and sounds and uh, the points. Um, so again, pretty simple. Um, so just to give you a sense of what the uh, what the A matrices look like, so how you'd actually set this up. Um, so this is the um, essentially the probability of the outcomes um, given the different positions you could be in um, um, and when the trial type or the stimulus or the, the trial condition uh, is a particular condition. So in this case, it would be um, the uh, avoid threat condition. Um, so basically each column here is one of the different possible positions on the runway. Um, each row is one of the different combinations of uh, outcomes, the uh, outcome stimuli you could observe. Um, so under the avoid threat condition, essentially the farther you are to the left, the higher the probability is that you'll see the negative stimulus. And the farther you are to the right, the higher the probability is you'll see the positive stimulus. Um, but the idea is that these probability distributions differ depending on which trial type you're in, right? So in, in, uh, in, uh, when the trial type is six, then this joint distribution ends up looking like the higher, the more you are over here, the higher probability is that you'll see the positive stimulus, but the higher, more you, the more you're over here to the right, the higher the probability that you'll get negative stimulus plus six points. Uh, sorry, conditions back here. Oh, oh, this, yes. Right, so essentially the different observations that you can make the way we set it up are just sun, just clouds, um, sun plus two points, clouds plus two points, clouds plus four points, and cloud plus six points, right? Um, and then you just have scaling factors essentially that, that govern how much uh, the value is the value of those outcomes are determined by how much you dislike the negative stimulus and how much each each point is worth to you. Um, so uh, anyway, so yeah, and again, we'll go through the model in detail. Yes. 
the rows are the different observations that you can get. Right, so you can observe the negative stimulus, you can observe the positive stimulus, you can observe negative stimulus plus four points, or positive stimulus plus two points. You know, I'm not showing all of them on every one just because it's cluttery, but across all of them, it's just negative, positive, positive plus two, negative plus two, negative four, negative six. Yeah. Oh, yes. Sorry, sorry. I didn't explain that. So, so the, the, just for convenience, um, in the, it just turns out, I mean, there's a bunch of different ways you could, you could choose to model this task. Um, the easiest way to do it here is to just um, give the agent a kind of starting position um, that's not sort of, that doesn't represent any kind of committed position that you've chosen on the runway. Um, so the, the first column is just kind of the starting position before you've chosen one of the nine positions. And the first row then is just the, uh, essentially this like blank observation <laughs> before you've observed where you've put the avatar. Um, so again, it's, it's, just, it's just for convenience. Um, Sorry, I should have explained that. Um, so then one thing that we did, um, so one thing that's important to do a lot of times if you wanna try to convince people that your parameters that you're estimating in a task are actually tracking something interesting or something useful or something real um, is to try to validate it against some other measures that you think are also gonna be relevant to the constructs that you're trying to uh, tap into. Um, and so in this case, you know, one way to do that is to ask a bunch of questions about self-reported experience or self-reported behavior on the task. Um, and so in this case, we just asked them a bunch of things, you know, like I found the positive pictures enjoyable, you know, one to seven, how much do you agree or disagree? Um, I found it difficult to decide which outcome I wanted. I always tried to move always towards the outcome with the largest reward. Um, uh, the negative pictures made me feel anxious or uncomfortable. Uh, this one, uh, this one about how anxious or uncomfortable you feel um, will be of a lot of interest uh, to me later, theoretically. Um, and then also you can measure other kind of standard behavioral things like reaction times and things like that that don't technically go into the model. So if the model can say something about reaction times and they didn't go into the model, then that can also be validating. Um, so just to give you a sense of what this ends up looking like in terms of the parameter validation, um, these are just Pearson correlations. Um, for uh, between each of the parameters and all those different questions we asked and also with average reaction times. And um, we actually get, you know, pretty much what you would hope for um, in a lot of cases. So the more you value, subjectively valued the points, um, the stronger your self-reported drive to approach the reward was, um, the less difficulty deciding you had, um, the less you avoided punishment, um, the faster your reaction times were, um, et cetera. Whereas beta, the more kind of uncertain, the more like a priori unconfident you were in your action model. Um, so you can think of that again as like decision uncertainty in this case um, was um, positively associated with reaction time. So the more uncertain you were, the longer it took you to make a choice. Um, and uh, uh, there's a bunch of these actually that are interesting, right? Like um, the more you chose to use uh, certain uh, negative emotion regulation strategies, for example. Um, and uh, probably most interestingly to me is this guy, um, which you have to remember in a sample size of like 500 is actually super significant, um, is that it wasn't actually the negative image uh, value or disvalue in this case that uh, said much about how anxious or uncomfortable they self-reported feeling. It was this um, decision uncertainty parameter. Um, so, so what's essentially what this kind of suggests is that inactive inference, the thing that amounts to or contributes to how subjectively unpleasant the valence of your state is, probably has a lot more to do with um, how confident you subjectively think you are in your action model, um, which again is just theoretically interesting. Yeah. This is based on data. Yeah. This is based on the data and the 500 people. Um, so it's just a parameter that you estimate. Um, so in this case, it's largely going to correspond to um, something like uh, inconsistency in choices across trials in the same condition. Um, but um, kind of, it, it will also be in a way that's disentangled from um, things about, say, how much you um, act as though you value the points 
um, and dislike the negative stimulus, right? So it's it's kind of a way of, the nice thing about modeling in this case is, right, you can kind of separate out the estimates of the most likely contrib relative contribution of these different sort of independent psychological factors. Um, so we'll go through the estimation though, um, but it's just an element in the parameter that you tweak until the model generates behavior that looks the most like the actual participant's behavior. Um, and so then here's um, some of the interesting group differences that we find. So when you just break people up into the healthy controls, the people with depression and or anxiety that don't have substance use and the people with substance use, most of which have either depression or anxiety. <laughs> um, and what it turns out is that um, actually both of the clinical groups um, show a greater um, negative value assigned to the uh, negative images. So they, they are more sensitive. Essentially, they act as though they expect the negative stimuli to be more aversive. Um, and uh, in the substance use group, they actually show um, lower beta values, which um, means that they are uh, less uncertain. So they act more confident um, than the healthy people about what, the, what they think the right thing to do is. Um, so in this case, they're more avoidant and substance use people are more confident that the avoidance strategy is right. Um, and uh, so it's interesting. Then there was actually no difference in the uh, point value, subjective point value. Um, we also found a difference in uh, uh, prior policy precision um, between males and females too, where um, females actually looked like they had uh, uh, less confidence in their action model um, than men on average. So they're more uncertain, or you can call that less impulsive too. <laughs> you know, like depends how you want to spin it. Um, so then, so that's kind of just a, you know, group difference kind of thing. Um, but obviously what's a lot more interesting is whether you can um, use this kind of thing to say something interesting about treatment outcomes. Um, and so here, what we did is, this is a, and I say I shouldn't, I didn't, I did, I analyzed the data and I built the model, but this is data that's being collected um, largely by a colleague of mine named Robin Offerly, who's a clinical uh, psychologist um, at Liber. Um, and basically this, this uh, study involves uh, 100 people um, that had uh, were recruited with generalized anxiety disorder. And they were then uh, randomized into two groups, um, either, and one got 10 weeks of exposure therapy and the other got 10 weeks of behavioral activation. Uh, a bunch of these people also had um, depression, um, as well as um, other uh, anxiety-related disorders. Um, so again, somewhat heterogeneous group. Um, as you can see here, response to therapy was also quite heterogeneous, um, but on average, both therapies worked. Um, and so we were just interested, do each, do any of these three parameters that we estimated at baseline, um, can they predict anything about treatment response? Um, and pretty cool, what we found is, is that uh, it actually predicts outcomes for both groups. Um, so uh, more or less the, the higher your beta value is, so the more uncertain you are in your action model, um, the better your response was to both therapies. So you measure this thing at baseline, then they go through the therapy and it turns out you can sort of say in advance fairly well, um, who's gonna do better? It doesn't differentiate responders to one treatment versus the other, which is one thing we were kind of hoping for, um, but it does say, you know, is therapy going to work for you in general, relatively speaking? Um, and, you know, I mean, my best way of making sense of this, and I should say this, this is for, um, this is based on uh, the Promise Depression Scale. Um, there was a similar result for the uh, Promise Anxiety Scale. Um, and um, so, again, my, my best way of making sense of this at the moment is um, just to say that, like, look, if you're really confident in your action model, and that action model is avoidance, <laughs> um, then you're probably going to be a lot less malleable, right? You're going to be a lot less open to trying new, uh, behaviors in therapy and being open to sort of counter evidence, right? So, so interestingly, the less confident you are in your action model, the more malleable you're going to be to update um, what your model is um, about what you should do in therapy. Um, is kind of the my current sort of pet interpretation. Um, and I should say, so this uh, these results we have a preprint up on BioArchive about right now, um, or actually it's on. FSL or OSF or whatever that one is, but uh, these we don't. This we don't have anything out on yet um, because uh, we're actually waiting to collect, collect more data to finish it up. Um, but it's close to being done. 
Um, so summary here is that you know it looks like avoidance in depression, anxiety, and substance use um, looks like it could be driven by more negative expected outcomes, and um, greater policy precision um, looks like it may indicate greater confidence in the avoidance strategy in substance use. Um, and the less confident you are um, in your avoidance strategy, the uh, the better your you look like you respond to therapy. Um, so, um, and I should say that one thing when you're building, trying to build a model of something like this that's worth emphasizing is that there is no learning in this model. Um, this is a purely inference-based task. You know, you know what the stimuli are going to be, um, and you just infer, okay, you know, what's my best bet based on the outcomes I want to observe based on um, my relative preferences about each outcome um, and the probabilities. Um, so using something like a kind of standard reinforcement learning model um, that requires you to be simulating learning um, doesn't necessarily work so well, whereas active inference is kind of nice for this because you can do a purely inference-based model. Um, it's not the only model that can do it, but it's, it's a nice feature of active inference models that you can do that. Um, okay, so now that hopefully I've motivated why this can be useful, um, let's, uh, let's try to build it. Um, so I showed you guys briefly how I structured the model. Maybe you've forgotten by now. Um, but so kind of just walking through the logic. So let's take you know part one of the model that I discussed yesterday. So just observations, states, how states are related to observations, and what your prior expectations over states are. So those are the first four parts, right? So what, so what are the states is the first thing that you need to specify when you're going to build a model. So then the question is, what does the agent need to know to do the task? Um, so anybody? I mean, I told you a while ago, but uh, if you don't remember, uh, any, any, any thoughts as to what, what you would need to know to do it? That is one. You got to know where you are to be able to know where you want to, you know, uh, yes, you need to know where you are and, uh, yeah, the other places that you could be, right? So position on the runway, that gives, it's going to need to be one hidden state factor. Um, what else? Not Maxwell. Um, no, so the points aren't actually something that needs to be a hidden state. Um, the points are going to be something that you observe, right? They're going to be an observation that may or may not be preferred, right? So, so what else? What else? So the image is also going to be an outcome. It's going to be a thing you observe. Uh, the probabilities are going to be in the A matrix. Those are the things that map the states to the observations. Values of the points is also an observation. The subjective value of the points is um, that's going to be in the C matrix, which we haven't gotten to. Um, yes, trial type or task condition. Remember, because where you're going to want to move on the runway is going to depend on knowing what condition you're in, right? So, so those are two things. You need to know where you are on the runway, and you got to know what condition you're, what task condition you're in. So, minimally, a minimal model of this task requires that the agent knows those two things, um, and it's sufficient that it knows those two things. Um, yes, and in this case, they're fairly trivial. It's just what you see on the screen. Um, so there's no uncertainty. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. But I mean, it's just an identity matrix. It's very, yeah. Um, any other questions at this point? Yeah. Um, well, you won't know where the sun is. So, I mean, actually, that's that's a good point. Um, well, interesting. Um, yes, I agree that if if no matter what, um, well, so that would I mean that would kind of make you go wrong in condition two here, right? Because it's sun versus sun plus points. And so, in this case, if you just had the policy of always going toward uh, the sun, then um, you wouldn't you wouldn't have any idea of what's on the other side. Um, Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Sure. Sure. Well, that's, I mean, that is about the neg- the expected, you know, negative value of the outcomes, right, ahead of time that governs decision making. And that is dependent on the context, right? That's dependent on the knowing that they're getting on the train <laughs> um, as opposed to being in some other situation. Um, yeah, I mean, so in this case, I mean, point, point totally taken. Um, you know, in this case, uh, you know, when it comes to the automaticity of what actions get selected, I mean, you have to remember that these, I mean, I didn't say that, but the, um, it's not as though the left and right positions of these are always stable, right? So, I mean, they do flip back and forth in, in counterbalanced ways. So it can't just be like, I'm always going to go right, or I'm always going to go left or something like that, right? So, I mean, if it's at that level of automatization, then I don't think it's a problem, but, but um, I agree, you can adopt the just play it safe no matter what <laughs> sort of strategy, um, which I'll show you some people behave that way. Um, so, which just falls out of the model. Um, so, okay. So states, only position and task condition. All right. So, um, so in practice in the actual scripts that we'll walk through in a second. Um, so this is just a little kind of cut and paste from part of the script. Um, in practice, you specify the hidden states and the number of levels to each hidden state by specifying the D vectors which are your priors over states. Um, so in this case, um, there remember there are two time points in the trial, right? There's the starting point where you make the choice of what position you're gonna go to, and then there's the position you go to. Um, and so the D here is your prior over initial states. So, um, so one then, how many different levels do we need for hidden state factor one, which is the positions? Um, anybody? Uh, so nine is nine is what you would think, right? But for because of the little kind of trick that we use, it's actually nine plus one. Starting position, starting plus the nine positions you can choose. Um, and what's the prior? What's the prior over that going to be? Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. One and a bunch of zeros. You're completely confident that you're always going to start in the starting position. <laughs> Right, that's all that means. Um, so how about for D2? Uh, so how many how many uh, levels are gonna be in that hidden state factor? There are five. Yes, five. <laughs> and what will the what's what should the prior look like over that? What's the prior distribution gonna look like? Um, yeah, so in this case, yes, it'll be flat. Um, so, so in practice, it can just be ones. I mean, this this is just going to get normalized, so it doesn't it doesn't matter. Um, so, uh, so it's just saying the agent has no prior beliefs that one task condition is more likely than any other. Yeah, you could, and and for this is kind of getting to stuff that we'll get into later with learning. For capital D, makes no difference it's just going to get normalized. Um, when it comes to learning priors, which will be little d, um, then it matters because they stand in for concentration parameter values. Um, but again, everybody ignore that for now. <laughs> um, okay, so so then so by setting up that that way, you're saying there are ten levels in hidden state factor one, and there are five levels in hidden state factor two, and those are the priors over those levels. Okay, so then we already kind of talked about this a little bit, but what does the agent need to see or to observe to know what states it's in? Right, so that's going to be your observations. Um, I already told you, but anyone? Right, so it needs to see this thing on the screen, right? It needs to, it needs to see what position it's in. Um, anything else? Exactly. So it needs to see these cues because those are what it's going to, those are what's going to tell it what task condition it's in. Right. Um, anything else? Uh, the, oh, well, that's, I mean, 
that's just that's just going to be part of the queue that tells you what condition you're in. This is really, actually, really, really obvious. What else does it have to observe? Yeah, it has to observe the, the actual outcome stimuli that it uh, does or does not want to see and hear, right? Um, so, so, uh, so yeah, so then those are, so those are the three observation modalities. Your runaway position cues, your task condition cues, and what? All right, <laughs> whatever that was. <laughs> um, Okay, so so right, so runaway position cues, task condition cues, and outcome stimuli, right? So the idea then is, just to make this clear, is that the um, that those observations, those three sets of observations, are going to be generated based on interactions between these two, where you are in these two hidden states, right? So for instance, being in that position combined with being in this condition. Um, Will convey a ninety will with ninety percent probability generate the observation of um, the negative stimulus and six points, right? The the probability is true. The agent the agent knows the probabilities and they're correct. Yeah. So there's no like I said, this is purely an inference task. There's no learning. Okay, so in practice, when you look at the script, um, the way that we set the number of outcomes per outcome modality is just with this kind of um, bit of code that more or less just sets up the A matrix, um, where all it's really doing is it's saying, based on D, based on the number of levels in each hidden state factor, make that many columns um, in, in the A matrix, and then for each outcome modality, give it the number of rows that correspond to the number of observations per observation modality. Um, so in this case, it's just going to be, um, so you have so 10 positions, right? Five conditions, um, because these are just one-to-one, -one, right? You observe the position, you know the position. You observe the condition, you know the condition. And then for the stimuli, um, what I showed you earlier is the way that we chose to do it is there's seven different um, formal observations that can be made in terms of the stimuli. Um, um, go over what in particular? Oh, uh, right, so I will um, uh, when I go through the A matrix. Um, so, so then the A matrix, um, right, so the idea is, is that that is explaining how states generate outcomes, um, which you can then invert to use for inference. So you observe the outcomes, you say conditional on those outcomes, what states am I most likely in? Um, and so here you need one A matrix per outcome modality. So per type of observation that you can get. Um, so in this case, we'll need three A matrices, one specifying how states generate the outcome stimuli, one specifying how the states generate condition cues, and one specifying how they state position, how they generate position cues. Um, so essentially, it's just that expanding out this arrow um, about how states mapped observations. Um, and so here is what uh, the first A matrix will look like. So the one specifying how states generate outcome stimuli. Um, so remember here, so the way we've set it up is there are one, two, three, four, five, um, One, two, three, four, five. Should be seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, okay. Yeah, all right. Uh, yes. Sorry, that is my fault. So you should have this one circled as well. <laughs> um, but so, so there should be one, two, three, four, five, six um, different outcomes that you can observe, um, plus the starting position one, right? Um, so that corresponds to seven rows in your A matrix. Um, so the columns then are each of the different positions you can be in, one being that starting position. Um, and then each row is going to be one of the different observation 
one of the different observations you could make. Um, and then the entries here encode the probabilities um, of observing each outcome given which state you're in. Um, but remember, um, these distributions are conditional on what condition you're in, right? So that's what this kind of third, the third dimension of this A matrix is, is saying conditional on being in the, you know, this condition, you know, the probabilities look like that. Conditional on being in condition two here, which is this guy, the probabilities look like that, et cetera. Um, so it's, it's encoding these probabilities, again, which are known. Um, then the other ones are really just kind of trivial, right? So you can either observe the cues that you are in, the avoid threat, the approach reward, the conflict two, four, and six. Um, and the states here, remember, are, so are, um, you know, this one stands for being in condition one, condition two, condition three, et cetera. So this is just an identity mapping um, along the third dimension, essentially. So if you observe these cues, then no matter what position on the runway you're in, you're in the you believe you're going to believe you're in the avoid avoid threat condition. That that all makes sense. Um, if anyone is confused by anything, uh, again, this is like for you guys to learn. So um, we can take like whatever as long as we need with this. Very, very. It's just saying what you observe tells you with 100% probability what state you're in. So there's no, basically, there's no uncertainty at all um, in, in uh, what you observe tells you about what's going on in the task. Uh, yes. No. Yeah, the partial, partially observable aspect of this doesn't matter at all for the aspects of the task um, that don't involve any uncertainty. <laughs> Right. So in this case, in this case, it it's necessary because of the probabilistic reward and punishment outcomes. Right. Um, and the um, I mean, the, yes, exactly. Because that's where you're specifying probabilities. Right. Um, and uh, equally trivial for position cues. Um, again, it's just I it's just saying it's an identity matrix for each of them. So just ones down the diagonal. Position equals position. <laughs> Right, so again, totally trivial. Um, but that's the true psychological ground truth, right? When you see the, you know, where the avatar is, you know where the avatar is. Um, okay, so any questions about any of that? Um, because the next thing we'll, we'll do is we'll add in the, the temporal dimension. Chirp, chirp. Uh, formally, it's very easy to do. You just make these things not once. <laughs> um, the uh, so the, the what the task condition is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, misreading the context cues. Yeah, absolutely. That's actually really interesting. Yeah, um, I mean, in the context of this task in particular, it's probably. Yeah, you'd have to design a different task where the context cues are a little more ambiguous, but absolutely, yeah. Um, and then formally, yeah, you just, instead of this just being, you know, ones, you could just, you know, make it blurrier. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, you'll see, I mean, obviously, like, uh, you know, using this, uh, again, where we're using uh, models that aren't um, fully sort of Bayesian inference based when making decisions when there's probabilities, right? Like, um, it's still, I mean, I still thought it gave us interesting results with the parameters, right? 
Um, but clearly these models are fancy enough that they can handle much more difficult nuanced problems. Absolutely. Um, okay. So then specifying the B matrix here. So again, conditional on being in state one, how you think, you know, what your prior is for what state two is going to be, um, or what the state is going to be at time two. Um, that then, um, you're going to need one B matrix for each, or one, one B matrix per state factor, right? So basically that's saying, how do runway positions, how do you believe runway positions are going to change over time? And um, how do you believe that conditions are going to change over time within a trial? Um, that should be, that needs to be uh, clear um, because um, the agent is just going to be equipped with the belief that the condition is always stable across a single trial. Right, it's not like the cues are going to change as it moves the avatar around, um, but you're going to need one matrix um, for the runway position observation or the runway observ runway position uh, state factor. Um, but because this runway position is under the control of the agent, um, there are actually going to need to be nine B matrices um, for this one B matrix corresponding to each possible action that the agent can choose, where an action is here specified as a transition. Um, so, so this is important that, um, that uh, well, here, I'll get to this in a second. But basically, what the policies are going to be when the policy pi thing appears up here is just um, selecting one of a bunch of possible B matrices, one of a bunch of possible transitions that are under the control of the agent. Um, so again, trivially. Just a little chunk of code here that just says for condition, it's an identity matrix. You know, the the, the task condition is not going to change while the agent's trying to make a decision about where to move. Um, whereas this the second part here is just saying that um, for each of the different levels in um, hidden state factor one, right? So ten, um, there's going to be a bunch of ones. Um, for each across one line for every possible action. Um, so at the end of the day, that just looks like this, right? So action one, so the B matrix one here, action one just basically says, no matter what position you're in, if you choose this B matrix, you're going to transition to state one. So columns are states and rows are states at T plus one time at the next time point. So if you're in one, you move to one. If you're in two, you move to one. If you're in three, you move to one, et cetera. So that's action one. Action two is no matter which state you're in, you move to state two. And then, you know, dot, dot, dot until action 10 is no matter what state you're in, you move to state 10. Um, so each of these is a possible action that can be chosen, each of those transitions. Um, and in this case, policies are going to be identical to actions because there's just one action, it's just one step. Um, but in practice, when you have tasks that require making selecting sort of chains, you know, sequences of actions, which is what a policy is, the sequence of actions, then um, allowable policies are going to be allowable sort of sequences of these, right? So it can be like, you know, B matrix two, then B matrix one, then B matrix three, um, and so forth. Um, and that's why you need a separate, you need to separately specify um, what the agent is allowed to do in terms of allowable policies, because maybe you want to say, you know, action 232 is allowed, but not 222 or something like that, right? So you have to specify what policies are actually plausible for the agent to pick um, when those consist of different possible sequences of actions or sequences of transitions that the agent has control over. Um, so in this case, it will just look like this. It will just, for the, um, for the second factor, so for condition, it's just all it's all just going to be ones because there is only one action that can ever be chosen. Just stay in the condition. Um, but for the runway position, um, this is saying that the agent can choose action two or action three or action four or action five or action six, seven, eight, nine, or ten. Um, there's no one because one would correspond to staying in the starting state, which they're not allowed to do. Um, uh, and then again, a little snippet of code for that. Uh,
Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so there are some cases where what looks like learning can be captured as inference. Um, there are many other cases where it can't. Um, the particular case you're talking about, um, I don't think you can capture that purely as inference, at least in the ways that pop into mind right now, um, in which case you'd have to activate the learning component of these models, um, which I will talk about um, uh, a little later. Um, but more or less, you're just um, with each observation, so on each trial, you know, whatever belief you are, whatever belief you have about what state you're in, um, you essentially tack on a count that says that state is, you know, that much more likely because I observed myself starting in that state in the past. Or every time I believe I'm in a certain uh, state and I observe a certain outcome, then attack on account in the A matrix that says, okay, now my belief that that state can generate that outcome is a little stronger. Um, so, so over time, essentially, you're building up priors about what states you're going to start in and what states are going to generate what observations. Um, just through previous, just through repeated experience, um, it's essentially it's essentially just heavy in just heavy in coincidence learning. Um, just ex mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so there are. So the reason I said that is because so one way to model that is to have different additional different possible observations where some observations could involve even more negative stimuli or something like that, in which case you would learn that, hey, being in this position actually generates even worse observations, um, in which case that would be a matrix learning. The other way you could do it is by um, somehow uh, involve a, um, somehow uh, model uh, learning the actual preference distribution itself. Um, which you can do, but it's a little bit kind of beyond the scope of, of this. That's what I just said. Yeah, yeah. You can you can fiddle with C, but um, learning C um, is a little bit more complicated. Um, but you can certainly fit C values like we do, right? To see what C is for each person for each possible observation. Um, so, um, so yes. Uh, but yeah, I mean, hopefully, hopefully, when I get to some of the learning stuff, uh, that can, that'll be a little bit more clear. Um, okay, so here, so preferences here, so your your C vectors. Um, so I'm just starting out saying, you know, these are just a bunch of zeros for each possible observation modality, and then I'm saying, okay, so the, for the first one, right, the one where I'm observing what the stimuli are that I observe at the end of each trial. Um, these have a particular value assigned to them at um, time point two, right? So column one is time point one, column two is time point two, um, and I'm parameterizing these. So here I'm saying that um, the value of negative image is just this parameter neg underscore img, um, and then positive underscore img, and then this one is the same parameter again, but plus um, two times whatever my subjective point value is, um, and then so on and so forth. So there's two parameters I'm fitting here. There's well, there's three. There's negative image, positive image, and point value. Um, but as you'll see, what we actually end up doing to make this um, invertible is you just fix the positive image value at zero. It's kind of like an anchor value, and then the the other two get adjusted around that. Um, so if I were to choose um, the parameter value of negative one for image, zero for positive image, and point value equals subjective point value equals one, then that's what the C vector would look like. It'd be negative one for the negative image observation, two for the positive image plus two, one for negative image plus two, three, and five. So this is just saying how much the agent prefers one over the other. But again, I mean, this is just arbitrary based on the, uh, based on the values of the parameters that I picked, but we're going to fit those and figure out which ones best reproduce each participant's behavior. OK, um, so then the last part of the model then, right, is you have, yes, sorry. Uh, so, um, so each column is a time point. Yeah, it's 
So at time point one, it's just always gonna be in the starting position, so it doesn't matter. But at time point two, it prefers, its preference distribution looks like that, where higher equals more positive. Um, so then E, like I said, we're not assuming any kind of habits here. So E is just a flat distribution with ones over each possible policy. Um, and uh, we have to set some value for, for beta, so for prior policy precision. In this case, we're fitting that as a parameter as well. Um, so I just put it as an example. You just multiply beta equals four, but, um, but this is something we're fitting. So we're going to get a value for this for each person. Um, and that's really it. Then you know, you've defined, well, so t is just the number of time points. So just t equals two in this case. But so you've defined each of these things. You just throw them into a structure that's labeled little mdp. Um, these three I've commented out because as I'll go into, if you, wanna, if you want to include learning, then you also include, you can also include little a, little b or little d, um, or little c or little e actually, but I just in practice don't use those much. Um, but these are all commented out because we're not, learning isn't happening. We're not separating out the, the actual generative process from uh, the, the agent's model. Um, and, uh, and again, beta just equals MVP beta just equals beta here, which we said in the example being four. Um, there are these other two that are worth mentioning. Um, so MDP.alpha um, is a, um, it's essentially a, an inverse temperature parameter. It's like, you can think about it as just encoding um, some, some level of uh, like behavioral noise or motor stochasticity. So I think kind of like shaky hand, you know, when you're pushing a button, there is always a little bit of that in human behavior. Um, and then ETA is a learning rate, um, basically governs how much of a count you actually tack, you know, tack on every time you have a new observation. Um, but again, that doesn't matter in this case because we're not including learning. Um, so once you have all that, um, then you, you know, set your parameter values for a simulation, and then you plug the whole MDP thing into this uh, very, very uh, dense and opaque function that Carl wrote called the uh, SPM to MDP dot V or underscore VB underscore X script. And it will take your model, run it, and via the uh, message passing algorithms that minimize uh, free energy, and it will spit out the results, what the agent chose. Um, and uh, so this is an example of the kind of simulation outputs that you'll get. Um, there's different plotting scripts depending on what you want to look at, but in this case, the, um, the plotting script for a single trial is this MDP underscore VB underscore trial um, function. And these are all just built into SPM in the DEM toolbox. So they're all just, as long as you have SPM 12, you're, it's all there. Um, and so the way that you can kind of read this is the, um, the darker the color, um, the higher the probability. Um, so in this case, the stronger the belief of the agent. Um, the little cyan dots represent kind of the ground truth. Um, so in this case, the agent believed that um, action 10, so moving to position 9, um, was the best move to make at the end of the day. And that is what it chose. Um, this is its beliefs about position. So it believes that at time one, it was in position one, and it believes at time two, it was at position 10, so, or state 10, so state, state factor one, level 10, so position nine. <laughs> um, and that was true. Um, and it believes that it was in the first condition, the avoid threat condition. Um, so more or less, it just moved all the way toward the sun because that was the that's the thing that made the most sense to do. <laughs> Um, because it was correct about what condition it was in. Um, now, like, like you were saying, if, uh, Lawrence, if, um, if it had some uncertainty about what condition it was in, um, then it wouldn't have been near that confident about where the right place to move would have been. Right. So this could have been more kind of gray, uh, like a more kind of diffuse probability distribution over different states, then you'd get different behavior. Um, ignore that. That doesn't really mean anything. <laughs> Um, this is just saying how it's, uh, this is just the posterior probability over policies. So it's how the policies essentially, how confidence in policies change over time. So, um, this is saying it was before it saw what position and condition it was in, it was completely uncertain about which of the nine possible policies it uh, should choose. And then after 
it saw the position and condition, it jumped up to being very confident in just the policy of going to the ninth position. Um, that update in confidence um, from, from before to after seeing the position and condition stimuli um, corresponds in the neural process theory to getting a little kind of bump in dopamine. Um, so that's where that, that kind of uh, change in policy precision um, is what, uh, what you would simulate as a kind of phasic dopamine response if you were going to try to use this in like a model-based fMRI analysis um, to see if you could, uh, you know, throw that in, to throw that like trial by trial prediction into like, say, like an fMRI simulation and see if you can actually track things that look like they plausibly correspond to uh, dopamine uh, sending or receiving brain regions, for example. Uh, Philip Schwartenbeck's actually done that in a paper from a couple of years ago and showed really nice um, ventral tegmental area activation, um, as well as cortical activation in a bunch of uh, known dopaminergic target regions. Um, so. Well, I mean, basically, it just, it just, um, like, it's just very confident in what the best decision is, right? So, I mean, the second, the second it, because uh, remember, in this condition, this is the avoid threat condition. It's basically there's a bad thing and there's a good thing. There's no conflict. There's nothing. So it's just fully rational. Like there is no uncertainty at all about you should just move toward the thing that's going to be good. <laughs> um, it it would be different you know, in the different conditions, especially if uh, beta was a higher number because it would have a lot more uncertainty. Um, um, so anyway, so then here at the bottom, this is showing the actual uh, observations um, and the colors here correspond to the relative preferences and the preference distribution. So basically it doesn't care what conditions it's in, it doesn't care what position it's in, but it does have um, interesting preference differences over um, the observations it can observe, the outcomes it can observe at time two. Um, so in this case, the distribution looks like that, and what it actually observed was uh, this guy, which I'm pretty sure is just the positive stimulus or something. Um, so that um, is more or less uh, how it works, beginning to end. Um, you can then um, you can then uh, run that repeatedly to get multiple trials. So in this case, for the task in question, we have uh, 60 trials um, in total. Um, and so you can run the thing under different parameter values and have the agent do it 60 times in a row. And then you can get a sense of what the actual behavior across the task would look like under different parameter values. Um, and then you can do that a bunch of times under different parameter values until you find the set of parameter values that best matches uh, a given participant's behavior. Um, and then those estimated values we'd actually use in further individual difference analyses. Um, and the, uh, the way to do that, um, or at least the way that we've done it, is um, using this uh, variational base function um, that's also just built into SPM um, that uh, minimizes variational free energy via uh, variational base. Um, it's this SPM uh, underscore NLSI underscore Newton uh, function. Um, and so what you need to do is you just take um, an agent's uh, observations from the actual task and what the actions they chose were on the task. Those go into these U and Y um, variables. And, um, and then you have to set some priors um, for what you think good kind of starting parameter, good plausible starting parameter values might be for anybody. Um, and then what it does is it will just start with those priors and then iteratively adjust them around until it finds values that minimize the log likelihood, i.e. maximize free energy, i.e. Um, produce the behavior that's most consistent with the actual agent's behavior or the actual participant's behavior. Um, but doing it this way, when you start with particular prior values, um, this particular algorithm, it penalizes um, moving the parameter estimates farther from the prior values that you set. Um, and that's a way of um, avoiding overfitting. So the idea is the farther you need to move parameters from the prior value that you thought was plausible, the more kind of uh, the more overfit something might look. So by penalizing that, 
your um, it's a way of preventing overfitting. Um, so it's finding the best fit parameters without moving them too far from the priors you set. Um, and um, so in practice, if you do that, um, it will look like this. Um, where over time, so as you, with each iteration, it will give you a log evidence or free energy. Um, and over time, what you hope to see is that this goes up every time and eventually converges on the parameter values that um, fit pretty well with the agent's behavior. Um, so in this case, you can just see this is just showing how the, um, how the parameter values change from the prior values. Um, and this is probably a clear depiction of this where for the negative image, I started it at a value of uh, one, which would be negative in the model. Um, and the posterior was less. For point value, it went up. And for beta, it went up. Um, and um, in that case, the direction in which those moved was consistent with what the actual values were that I plugged into the simulation, which is what you want to see to know that your model's recoverable. <laughs> um, so, um, so I can actually just, yes. Well, I mean, it's just it's just depending on the sign, right? Like in um, in engineering, a lot of times it is cast as maximizing. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, you can think about this. Yes, it's identical to. Yeah. Yeah. Right, and uh, that is one of those things that uh, you know. Carl, Carl could have been clearer about when he wrote these scripts, <laughs> but right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, mm. sure, no, and that's a, that's a good point. I am um, that I should have mentioned and didn't um, that, yeah. I mean, it's just, I mean, the point is, yes, that it is converging to an optimal value. Um, um, so um, just to actually show you a little bit in the actual, so here is, so now, if you know, if you guys want to look at it, here is the actual, this uh, AAC underscore model underscore example. So this is the full script that I just kind of went through with snapshots piece by piece. You know, so clear all, close all. I just set the uh, random number generator to shuffle just so it doesn't produce the exact same thing every time. I set my parameter values to particular values. Um, this is just, again, exactly just piece by piece what I showed you. Um, I don't think I really left anything out. Um, and uh, one thing I guess worth mentioning is, is that you can either specify policies in terms of U or V. Um, U is if you want policies to be shallow, which means they only look one step ahead. And V is, um, in practice, if you want the policies to be deep, so the agent looks all ahead all the way to the end of the, ahead all the way till the end of the trial. Um, you can specify it as V, even if, uh, your trial, if it's only one step though, which I, which I, um, kind of like to do because if you specify it as U, then it won't spit out the dopamine simulations. Um, but, uh, okay. So then... Anyway, I mean, this is, this is just um, basically giving it labels, giving the plotting routine labels. Uh, this checking thing is just a thing that helps you know that you didn't mess up something, you didn't write something inconsistent in your generative model before you run it. Um, then you run it. Then this is the VB trial uh, plot. Then this is um, just a couple other plots um, that you can generate that Carl's written plotting scripts for. Um, and then here is if I want to run more than one trial, then I can just expand the MDP um, that I made. So it's just replicated over several uh, trials. And then you can just run that whole thing again with the same function. And then there are plotting routines for um, looking at behavior across trials. Um, you know, so if I do this, um, let's run one of these. Uh, Normally it's very fast, but on this computer it's kind of slow. Um, so I probably won't run the group one, <laughs> but um, but here you go. This is the this I mean this is basically the exact same thing as the one I showed you. Um, 
but and this is a another plot that I'm probably not going to go through this. It's not all that interesting in the context of this task, but they're just it's just other depictions of things in the model or what the neural process theory would predict. Um, but um, if you want to know more about this kind of thing, I can we can talk about it later. It's just going to be con more confusing for now, I think. Um, but if uh, if this if it wasn't so well, maybe I can do it. Um, I was going to say. Um, going to say it might take too long to um, to run the multiple trials version, but um, it's probably worth you guys seeing a little bit what it looks like. Um, so more or less, this is just, so this is showing five trials, and these are just different sorts of plots that um, more or less just encode the uh, free energy or expected utility um, of the observations on each trial. Uh, they're just kind of different kind of ways of coding. The same thing as in the um, the uh, single trial plots, um, but just over multiple trials. And again, if you want to know details about what each of those mean, then I can, I can, um, we can talk about it individually later. It's not that, not that important for now. Um, but in the and then in the second script that I um, gave you guys, which is this inversion example script, this um, has everything you need to actually do the. Uh, Parameter estimation, the model inversion that I uh, that I showed you the example of where the thing will converge on the optimal free energy value. Um, it's also probably a little involved to go into in detail, but here I just set the number of trials, um, and then I set the parameter values that I to fix values that I don't want to estimate. Um, then I set the um, some values that don't actually or that. Well, in this case, I'm setting the values, the true parameter values for the simulation I'm going to run. Um, I just kind of specify them here um, so that it will spit them out at the end so I can compare them to the actual uh, model estimates. Um, this is just putting together um, the uh, U and Y. All this is just putting together the U and Y vectors that are going to be the observations and the actions that get fed into the um, estimation routine. Um, and then um, down here, uh, more or less, I just specify which of the um, parameters I actually want to estimate. Um, and then all of that goes into this uh, DCM structure, along with the U and Y, which are the, um, the stimuli and the actions. Um, and then you run this, uh, um, and then you turn that into, uh, you take that DCM, and you run it through the actual AAC inversion script um, that I wrote, which is um, just this function that's appended below. And um, this is the one that, um, in turn, you set the priors for. So this is basically saying if I want to, um, I want to say that my prior for beta is one, and I put that in log space to keep it positive so that during estimation it doesn't um, become a negative number because beta can't be a negative number. Um, and then same thing for point value um, and for any of these others. Um, but it will only catch them if I say I want to estimate these. So in this case, it'll estimate beta, negative image, and point value. And so here are the priors I put are, um, yes? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it will, um, so basically what I'll do is I just, um, I just exponentiate it down here so it stays uh, non-zero. It's, it's literally just a trick, so it never becomes negative during the estimation. Um, um, but, but so anyways, you do that, and then um, at the end of the day, it goes into this guy, which is the actual uh, estimation routine that runs the variational base. Um, and then you also need a log likelihood function, um, which uh, is written here. Basically, it just takes, you start out with an L value of zero, and then it will repeatedly um, just add uh, the previous log likelihood value to the log probability of the, um, it's basically the probability um, that the model assigns to the action that the agent actually chose. Um, and so it tries to maximize that uh, over, over iterations. What do you say? Oh, it's just it's just adding a little kind of small number to make sure that it never um, becomes zero. 
Um, and then this is just reproducing the uh, generative model that we already walked through, but just as a function. Um, and then that's it. Um, so you can toy around with this. Um, obviously, I've skipped through a little kind of just procedural things to just assigning different variables to other things just for sake of time. But um, if I run this, then it will simulate 60 trials, and then it will try to fit them. Uh, and uh, I this probably will take way too long to even show you any of it. But give it a sec. Well, that's that's just the single trial result. <laughs> um, yeah. Give it like another. I don't know. Uh, see, it produced its first log likelihood estimate of negative fifty nine, um, and it'll. So basically, it'll it'll bounce around like small fluctuations around that number for a certain number of iterations, basically until it's kind of tried out little adjustments to each of the parameters, and then it'll jump on the next iteration to whatever goes down the gradient. Um, um, but I'm not going to uh, not going to run that the whole way because no way we'll have any time. Um, so okay. Um, so anyway, so that's. So that's kind of beginning to end thoroughly through one task, um, um, which already I realize is probably a lot. <laughs> um, there were, you know, maybe we don't have to go into as much detail on the other ones, but I mean, another task that we were kind of excited about that's like an even kind of simpler model is this uh, model that we built of an uh, interoceptive awareness task. Um, this is meant to kind of capture this idea that a lot of people in computational psychiatry right now um, kind of like this idea that um, what might be going wrong is something about the precision estimates assigned to afferent signals from the body um, and the way that contributes to um, either representing and understanding bodily states um, and also um, subsequent visceral motor regulation. Um, and so, but no one's actually kind of tried to explicitly show in any kind of model that um, um, different clinical groups actually do assign, look like they assign different precision estimates to afferent interoceptive signals. Um, so we thought we'd give it a go. Um, and um, so we use this kind of really simple heartbeat tapping task. Um, and the idea is literally just for uh, 60 seconds, we just say tap a button whenever you feel your heartbeat. And then we simultaneously record EKG um, and pulse transit time and things like that. Um, so we know when their actual heartbeat was and what the soonest is that they would have felt it. Um, and so we did this under three conditions plus a control condition. One where we said, just guess, do your best. Another where we said, don't guess, only press the button if you're totally sure. Um, and the third one where the no guessing uh, stipulation was still in place, but we also did an interoceptive perturbation where we had them hold their breath um, with the hope of kind of uh, amplifying the afferent signal. And the reason that's important is because um, most people at rest have a really, really terrible conscious interoception. Um, only about 35% of people in these tasks typically show greater than chance performance um, when they're trying to like indicate when they feel their heartbeat. Um, so to really get things off of floor values um, in a way that would be meaningful, you probably have to do some kind of perturbation um, where you're getting the kind of variance that will be more interesting. Um, but you had to like control, right, for like something like their guessing rate and also something like how uh, conservative or liberal they're being. Um, and so we did that. Again, we did that in that same sample. Um, but in this case, we actually just did to try to, we just did decide to divide it up a little more fine grain. So it's healthy people, people with depression, um, people with anxiety, people with anxiety and depression. <laughs> Uh, eating disorders, we had like 18 people in the substance use group. So it's a pretty broad clinical group. Um, this is the way we set up the model. Uh, it looks more complicated than it is. Um, more or less what we did is we just divided. Um, we took their actual um, cardiac events um, and we divided and then we added 200 milliseconds for pulse transit time. And then you, uh, we just basically divided the epics um, in half so that um, between heartbeats, if you tapped um, in the first half of the time before the next heartbeat, 
then that counted as tapping during a systole. Um, otherwise, it was tapping as a dia uh, under a diastole. Um, and so that's it. So the observations here were just a systole or a diastole, um, which was just based on their EKG plus plus transit time. Um, and then the other set of observations is just the conjunction um, of whether they tapped and a systole, uh, didn't tap and a systole, tapped and a diastole, no tap and a diastole. These are, this is uh, considered the afferent input that the brain is getting from their, from the body. So it is there, it's equivalent to like a visual stimulus, but just coming up from their heart. Um, and, um, and then this then is just basically encoding what they want, right? They're going to prefer to tap when there's a systole, to tap and to observe that they tapped and observe a systole, um, and not observe a no tap and a systole, et cetera, right? So just just true positives, false positives, uh, true, uh, wait a minute, guys, wrong. It's true positives, true negatives, false positives, false negatives. Um, and, um, and so what we fit here is then just, um, so the C values, essentially how much they wanted to observe tapping in systole um, and the inverse for no tapping in systole and, um, and the same thing for, uh, diastole and tapping versus no tapping. And, and it's a little bit um, hard to understand intuitively, but what this ends up acting as is just a bias for tapping versus not tapping. Um, so the the higher, um, the if you look at, if you just take the PNT um, value, which is essentially how much they prefer to not get a false positive um, versus PT, which is how much they, what the magnitude is that they prefer not getting a false negative, um, then it, end up, it just ends up this, uh, ends up just giving you essentially a metric of their bias against tapping. Um, so it's just, it's just kind of a measure of, you know, are they the kind of person that likes to tap a lot or not very much? It's kind of like a kind of trait conservatism. Think about it as that. Um, the other kind of thing that you can do, and again, this isn't initially all that intuitive, but if you just take the average of those two, so they, the average magnitude of their preference, of the preferences they have for both of those things, then if that's a positive value, then what that means is that, um, what that means is that they actually had a strong preference to tap after um, feeling a heartbeat. Whereas if that, if that is negative, then it means that they were actually an anticipator. They reliably tried to tap right before a heart rate. Um, so you can kind of differentiate between uh, anticipatory versus reactive strategies. Okay. Um, and then, but the most interesting one that we wanted to estimate was um, interoceptive precision. So essentially the, the precision of the mapping from systoles and diastoles to felt uh, heartbeats or not heartbeats, um, where the other, where the controllable hidden state factor was choosing to tap or not tap. Um, um, right, so the higher the IP value equals more precise. And then I already explained this kind of tapping, no tapping bias thing. Um, and so, this is the kind of thing that we find. Um, so this is the bias against tapping measure. And um, as you can see, and as you would as you would hope, that this value is much higher in the no guessing condition and the breath hold condition um, than in the guessing condition. So it's, people are a lot more conservative in when they choose to tap in these two, which is exactly what you would expect. This is just, again, a kind of parameter validation kind of thing. Um, the sensory precision is uh, really high in the control tone condition. Sorry, I didn't explain that. Basically the control condition is they just kept hearing a tone and they had to tap whenever they heard a tone. Um, and so precision estimates are really high for auditory precision in the tone condition and they're super, super low, um, you know, except for some people who look like outliers in the others. Um, and for the anticipate versus react thing, the average um, of the C magnitudes, what you get is basically a big chunk of people that are around zero. <laughs> Um, which basically means they were really inconsistent in their tapping, which is just correlated with the sensory precision. Um, but then you have a good chunk of people that are on either end that are kind of reliable anticipators versus reliable reactors. Um, so you can think some is like relying a lot more on prior expectations and others relying a lot more on sensory um, input. Um, and um, so in terms of further uh, parameter validation, 
Um, we just at, we just looked at a bunch of different things. So pulse transit time, uh, number of heartbeats, so heart rate um, for each person, self-reported difficulty of the task, self-reported confidence that they did it right, um, self-reported felt heartbeat intensity, and then age okay. and um, uh, uh, BMI, so body mass index. Um, they're just all things that influence cardiac perception. Um, and so what we found that's kind of cool is that for interoceptive precision, um, it was positively associated with confidence and intensity, even in the guessing condition. Um, and uh, whereas in the no guessing and the breath hold condition, both where this conservatism was higher, um, the uh, bias against tapping um, was uh, associated in the directions you'd expect with difficulty and confidence and intensity. Um, and uh, those are actually pretty similar. Um, it's nothing else all that interesting. What's kind of interesting, even in the tone condition, when the precision is essentially maximal, you do get this kind of age difference in whether people are anticipators versus reactors, which is kind of interesting. Um, there weren't really all that many interesting differences uh, or any interesting relationships here. Basically, sensory precision in one condition didn't really map on all that well to sensory precision in other conditions. Um, between the no guessing condition and the breath hold condition, there was more similarity in sensory precision, but not that much. Biases against tapping was actually looked like it was kind of more trait ish across conditions for people. Um, but the, the interesting result um, is that the main interesting result is that when you look across groups for our interoceptive precision um, estimates, they, the healthy controls do have significantly higher interoceptive precision than all of the clinical groups. Um, and uh, the um, and then the other interesting effect that we saw was that actually medication status um, strongly blunted interoceptive precision. So if you were on any kind of psychiatric medication, your interoceptive precision was much less. Um, and uh, um, anyway, it doesn't look like we have time, but I could have gone through basically how we uh, specified the model for that. Um, the only thing probably worth mentioning is the way that we specified interoceptive precision. So in this case, the way to fit this kind of precision parameter is you start just with diastole and systole mapping as an identity matrix to feeling a heartbeat and not. Um, but then you can pass this thing through a uh, softmax function with a particular temperature parameter. So what ends up happening is if this PA or interoceptive precision is high, it ends up looking like an identity matrix. Whereas the lower you may have to get this thing, the more uh, imprecise it ends up looking. Right, so if a person has values down here, that means that the signal they get from systole and diastole provides a lot less precise evidence for the presence of a beat or no beat. Um, and uh, yes. Mm -hmm. so there, yeah, I mean, and again, I, I can go through, you know, all this with you guys more, you know, just in person one, one at a time or whatever, if you guys want to, um, but these are, you know, I just kind of listed the whole model up here uh, in case you guys want to look at it. But the, the way you estimate parameters is the same. Um, definitely won't have time to go into the uh, three arm bandit reward learning version or our, uh, or our structural learning stuff. But um, hopefully this was helpful. And uh, Casper is going to have a bunch of time tomorrow to uh, take us further. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, any, any questions or anything like that? I mean, obviously we've been asking some along the way. Uh